I'd like to welcome everybody here today on this wonderful, finally, uh, warm day in Chicago. Uh, thank you all for coming. Can I get a show of hands um, if this is your first CADS event? Oh, we have quite a few new people today. Well, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Mark Garzon. Um, I'm the new president um, as of February. Uh, we have a lot of exciting programs coming up. Um, the, I'm not sure if you had seen, but um, the next lecture that we have is going to be on June 11th with um, noted scholar Richard Guy Wilson, and he's going to be talking about the differences and the origins of Art Deco and how the different styles have been fragmented, and especially here in Chicago, what American designers have done um, to kind of integrate those styles. So that's going to be at the Oriental Institute on Thursday, June 11th, so make sure to mark your calendars for that and we hope to see you there. Um, if you have any questions regarding the organization, um, feel free to contact one of our board members tonight. Uh, board members, could I get uh, some hands raised so that people know who you are? Um, Joe Loundy, Suzanne Peterson, um, Conrad Mitchko, um, Steve is over there uh, at the reception. And um, so, again, feel free. We're a very friendly group, so talk to us if you have any questions. Uh, please sign up also for our newsletter, and that can be found on our website. We'll continually be updating information on there. So um, as far as lectures, events, uh, stay tuned, because we have a couple of other things that are, be, that are going on that we're still planning. Um, so tonight, I wanted to introduce um, our distinguished guests. Um, but before I do, I'm going to plug what they are planning in November. So in November this year, there's going to be an International World Congress on Art Deco in Shanghai. Um, our guests are the planners for that. So in addition to talking about the architecture there tonight, they're going to be planning tours, lectures, and events in Shanghai. So I would suggest that you visit their website information can be found here as well as travel arrangements. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guests tonight. Um, Mr. Patrick Cranley and Ms. Tina, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go slowly on your last name, Kenna Garatnam um, are here from Shanghai and I'm gonna introduce Patrick. Um, he is a native of Baltimore, and he has been a student of Chinese affairs for more than 30 years and has lived in China for over 20 years. Um, he's a frequent speaker on Shanghai history, architecture, society, and business, and has written for dozens of newspapers and magazines worldwide, and has authored chapters on um, Shanghai in Insight Guide to Shanghai, Still More Shanghai Walks, and Step by Step Shanghai. His historic and architectural tours of Shanghai are recommended by Condé Nast Traveler, Lux Guide to Shanghai, Nota Bene, Departures Magazine, and a number of other top-tier travel companies. Patrick is a managing director of Asia Media Limited, a marketing and communications consulting company based in Shanghai. And more importantly, tonight, he is the current president of Historic Shanghai, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the city's social, economic, and architectural history. Throughout the organization's history, its research and programming, um, the group has strived to raise awareness of the value of Shanghai's social and architectural heritage and to educate new generations about the city's fascinating history. And hopefully we'll get a preview of that tonight. Coming up um, this November again is going to be historic Shanghai's um, the World Congress. So again, feel free to ask Patrick any questions and Tina any questions about the details of that. Um, besides already the extensive accomplishments that I've listed, Mr. Cranley has degrees from Brown University, Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan, and the Ross School of Business, and certificates from the University of Dijon, Johns Hopkins University, Nanjing University Center for Chinese and American Studies. He's a member of the National Committee on U.S.-Chinese Relations and has served as governor of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai for five years, including a term as chairman in 2000. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Pratik Cranley. Well, thank you for that, for that very kind introduction, Mark. Um, 
Tina and I are really pleased to be here in Chicago. Uh, as she's, This is Tina's first visit, but I've been here a couple of times. And wherever I go, and she will vouch for me, I tell people that Chicago is one of the greatest cities in the world for architecture. And uh, I think she's been convinced already of that. Um, I'd like to thank Joe Loundy for, first of all, the terrific work he's been doing in Chicago uh, with the Chicago Art Deco Society, but also in cultivating uh, um, the future leaders, both of this society as well as of the International Coalition of Art Deco Societies. That's a group of um, like-minded individuals all over the world who are interested in this special style called Art Deco. Um, I'm here today to talk with you about the World Congress on Art Deco and Shanghai. Um, it's a complicated story, Shanghai story, so um, perhaps we'll spend a little time on that and I will be happy to answer questions at any time during the lecture or afterwards. On the left, you see the logo of the World Congress on Art Deco, and it may look a little bit more complicated than it actually is. The right and left-hand sides, the sides with no uh, color there, actually are the Chinese words for the World Congress on Art Deco, 2015. Um, <clears throat> and I guarantee you, by the end of the Congress, you will be able to read that. No, you, you, <laughs> You will not be able to read that. And of course, we're going to talk about architecture at the World Congress, uh, but we're also going to be talking about interior design, graphic arts, uh, furniture design, and the people who created and uh, uh, these buildings lived in them um, and lived very interesting lives. Uh, in fact, the lady sitting in the studio portrait, that's in an Art Deco background in a, a photography studio in Shanghai, is the mother-in-law of one of our friends. She's still around. And as part of our World Congress, we'll have experts uh, on some of the characters from back then, and also some of the relatives of people who lived back in the golden age of Art Deco in Shanghai. Uh, our group is called Historic Shanghai. We are a member of the International Coalition of Art Deco Societies. We don't just do Art Deco, we do uh, Shanghai uh, cultural heritage as it is manifested in both the physical heritage as well as uh, the people and the stories, uh, not just during the Art Deco period but throughout its fascinating history. And it is a complicated story. Those of you who are new to the whole topic of Shanghai may think of it as this. Some of the tallest buildings in the world and a place where the future is very much uh, on display. Uh, but of course, as a part of a very ancient society, there is also history there. This is the Longhua Pagoda, uh, first built more than a millennium ago uh, but reconstructed many, many times. There is some uh, history of this age in Shanghai, but not that much. It is a history, uh, a city built primarily during the last 160 or so years. So, for instance, uh, some of the tallest buildings in the world, like this one, take their inspiration from Chinese pagoda architecture. But the Jin Mao Tower, uh, one of the most distinctive buildings in Shanghai today, was designed by Skidmore Owings Merrill of Chicago. <laughs> so there is a Chicago connection as well, and a very active Chicago society, by the way, just of, of people. <laughs> they're, they're very cute about how uh, you qualify to be a member of the Chicago Society in Shanghai. That's people who were born here, people who went to school here, people who have relatives here, and people who have been through Chicago O'Hare Airport. <laughs> so I'm a member. <laughs> Um, some of you are of a certain age. You may associate China with this era, the Maoist period. Um, but in Shanghai today, you're more likely to run into people that look, look like this than you are uh, a, a dyed-in-the-wool Maoist, that's for sure. It is the largest city in China. It is the richest city in China. And it is the most cosmopolitan city in China. Uh, it is a very exciting place to live and work. And as I always say to people who come uh, on tours with me, because I've taken thousands of people around Shanghai, New Yorkers get it right away. 
It is a very cosmopolitan city with a lot of energy on the streets. And I think that it is also true for Chicago people. You live in one of the greatest, most dynamic cities in the world. You get it. The difference being, perhaps, scale. Uh, Shanghai has a population of 24 million people, which is, I guess, almost five times the size of Chicago. And it is larger than the population of Australia. <laughs> there are almost 200 cities in China with greater than one million population. Wrap your head around that. Uh, and Shanghai is number one. You will come into, if you come to the World Congress on Art Deco, the Pudong International Airport, designed by uh, the French architect Paul Andreux, who also designed the uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. You may choose to get into the city on the magnetic levitation train, which goes 300 miles an hour and gets you to the city in seven and a half minutes. If you drive, it'll take you about 45 minutes. Um, on the way, you'll pass such uh, cultural centers as the Oriental Performing Arts Center, also by Mr. Andra. Uh, and when you get to your hotel, because our hotels are on just the other side of the Huangpu River, uh, that will be your view. But our conference is going to concentrate primarily on the Shanghai of some uh, 80 years ago. Um, and this is the side of the river that you would be staying on, the Bund, uh, which is a funny word, right? It's not English, it's not Chinese. What is the, the word Bund? Where does that come from? There is a German word, Bund, but that's not where the word comes from. It's uh, a word like a lot of words in the English language, borrowed by the British when they were col the colonial masters of India. It is a Hindi word. It means the embankment of a river. Um, so there are other buns in the world, but the Shanghai Bund is the most famous one. And in the old days, it was lined with uh, European-style buildings housing the great trading companies and banking institutions of that time. Uh, and the piers of the main port were right there on the other side of the Bund. Most of the buildings on the Bund are of neoclassical design, built between 1910 and 1925. But there are three buildings that are, and I, maybe I'll skip ahead a little bit, three buildings that are uh, Art Deco in design. The one on the left, known today as the Peace Hotel, but built as the Cathay Hotel. The Bank of China uh, on its right, and I think I have a picture, yes, of the Bank of Communications. So those are the three Art Deco buildings on the Bund. And again, we'll talk lots about architecture, but we're also going to talk a lot about the people of that time. And this is uh, a poster, actually, of that time, uh, used in advertising different products. Um, and it shows the lifestyle to which most Shanghai people aspired in that time. And uh, maybe those dresses don't look uh, familiar to you, but that's uh, very much 1920s and 30s. Are, uh, Qi Pao is the name of that dress. So as soon as you see uh, that, you know which um, uh, era you're in. Uh, and if you look closely, for instance, on the far right-hand side, you'll see an Art Deco sconce on the wall. The chairs in the foreground here also show those trademark speed lines of the mid-period of the Art Deco period. Uh, and other uh, elements are also Art Deco. But the main thing is there was a lot of money floating around in Shanghai during the 1920s and 30s. It was a boom period uh, economically in China, and therefore, lifestyles uh, took on a quite a bit of glamour and gleam. These are ladies of leisure, and they're playing the quintessentially uh, Chinese game called mahjong. Anybody here know how to play mahjong? I knew there would be some. <laughs> uh, this, this was just to show you the neoclassical buildings on the Bund. Uh, the Cathay Hotel, or the Peace Hotel, or the Fairmont Peace Hotel as we now know it, as I mentioned, is probably one of the most iconic buildings on the Bund, uh, and the first major Art Deco building built uh, in Shanghai, 2829. Uh, this is one of our host hotels for the World Congress, okay? So you can choose to stay here if you wish. Uh, it was the flagship property of a businessman 
whose grandfather had come to Shanghai way back in 1845. The British had defeated China in a war, the Opium War, the first Opium War, in 1842, and opened Shanghai to trade uh, in the following year. So 1845, it was a British port, and the uh, grandfather of Sir Victor Sassoon came to Shanghai, liked what he saw, and uh, founded the, uh, a branch of his business, which did very, very well. David Sassoon uh, was operating out of the British port of Bombay in India, but he was not from Bombay. He was from a little town called Baghdad. He was an Iraqi Jew, a Sephardic Jew, uh, who was trading in, in British India, came to Shanghai, made a lot of money. His son took over the business in the 1880s and his grandson in, the 19, in 1920 and built this building uh, on the most expensive piece of property in the city, in the country, at the corner of the Bund and Nanjing Road, the major uh, commercial street through the uh, international settlement. And I'll describe how the international settlement came about in just a minute. This is the interior, uh, perhaps not uh, prototypically uh, uh, Art Deco, but with many, many Art Deco elements and a very good representation of that earlier period of Art Deco, where there is more ornamentation, uh, organic shapes that we are familiar with from the Art Nouveau period uh, pre, uh, preceding it, um, and many, many geometric patterns, uh, zigzag patterns and others that were typical of the early Art Deco period. That's Sir Victor on the left, quite a dashing figure, was he not? Uh, with some of his friends uh, partying at the hotel in the 1930s. Um, so we're gonna be talking about both the personages as well as the physical heritage that they left behind. And each one of these, uh, these characters in the picture have a story. Uh, Sir Victor, like all wealthy men in old Shanghai, owned and raced horses at the Shanghai race course, and he also liked to gamble on the dogs at the Canadrome, the dog racetrack, and he, in fact, memorialized his favorite racing animals in the design of the Cathay Hotel. These are bronze dogs looking back at each other um, across a shield on the exterior of the building in the bronze uh, ornamental windows. You'll see the same dogs rendered in stone uh, just under the green pyramidal roof and again and again inside in the ornamental plaster interior. The eighth floor holds both a beautiful uh, Shanghai-style Art Deco restaurant and this uh, ballroom with its original uh, sprung wooden dance floor. Uh, it is a, the place where Sir Victor threw some of his most uh, celebrated costume parties, very convenient for him because he had a suite of rooms in the tower above. He just had to stumble upstairs at the end of the night he was home. Uh, but this is where we will have our final gala party at the end of the World Congress, fittingly I hope. And I also hope we'll have the uh, appropriate swing band in there to provide the entertainment. Right, so how did Shanghai become this cosmopolitan place in the middle of China? <coughs> It's a complicated story, as I mentioned, so I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, but in brief, the British arrived first after that war that they fought, right? The first Opium War. In 1843, they arrived. Uh, and the uh, Chinese, who were living within the walls of what the foreigners called the Chinese city, you see at the bottom of the map there, uh, they, they, they uh, said, well, you know, we're here to trade. Where shall we do that? And the Chinese said, well, we don't want you inside the city wall. Why don't you go just north of the uh, city and uh, down by the river and do your thing there? And the British said, great, we're here to trade. And they set right to work building their homes and uh, uh, warehouses, and that's what became the Bund. Now, the other major maritime powers in the world did not wish to see the British have a monopoly on trade in China. And so they, these other countries also sent representatives to China and they negotiated bilateral treaties with the Qing imperial government of China, uh, allowing their citizens to live and work in Shanghai, the second country to arrive uh, on the coattails of the British, the United States of America. And when the Americans arrived, they settled just north of the British settlement uh, across the Suzhou Creek, which you can't really see very well on that map. And then the French arrived, and they squeezed in between that city wall and the 
British settlement, and then dozens of other countries came and made similar deals. But the problem was these guys were all sailors. They didn't know the first thing about running a colony abroad. So in 1863, that's 20 years after the British first arrived, all of the foreign uh, nationals threw in their lots together and they formed a multinational government for the foreign part of the city, the part that the emperor had designated as okay for the foreigners to live in. And so after 1863, there is no more British settlement, no more American settlement, it's the international settlement. Not the colony of any one country, but this strange animal where they made the laws up where they, as they went along. Uh, everybody went in on this, of course, except for the French. <laughs> who, uh, you know, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. So they kept their little part of, of uh, Shanghai. They had their own municipal council, their own judiciary, their own uh, uh, police force, etc. And so that was the beginning of what became known as the French Concession. Called that because on paper, to save face, the emperor did not cede sovereignty to this area. He simply allowed the foreigners to live in these areas and to be governed, importantly, not by the laws of China, but by the laws of their home countries. The golden age of imperialism had begun in uh, China. Now, in the early days, in the early years, uh, the foreign settlements were just down by the river. But as the city was successful as a port, more and more people came to Shanghai from all over China and from all over the world. And from time to time, the foreign uh, representatives asked the Chinese authorities for more space to be made available to them. Now, again, this was not, this was not land given to the foreigners. They had to pay whoever owned the land for the right uh, to use it. Um, but within these boundaries, they had their, their own say. Now, this is a map from 1925, and the last extensions to the international settlement and the French concession happened in the early part of the 20th century, and these were the, where the boundaries were as of World War II. Um, and during the war, the British and the Americans uh, said to Chiang Kai-shek, who was the president of the Republic of China during the Art Deco period from 1927 to 1949, uh, they said, Roosevelt and, and uh, Churchill said to him, you know, you've been trying to get us to give up our rights in China for decades now. And we're willing to do that now if you will promise to fight hard against the Japanese who had occupied the eastern part of China. And Chiang Kai-shek took the deal, of course. So at the end of the war, uh, this was no longer foreign territory. The foreign settlements were finished at the end of the Second World War. And so the period between 1945 and 1949, this was Chinese territory once again, Chiang Kai-shek's Chinese territory. But of course, he immediately fell into a civil war with Mao Zedong and the Communist Party forces and lost that war, right? So Chiang Kai-shek, 1949, retreated to Taiwan under the protection of Uncle Sam, and the uh, People's Republic of China was uh, formed and no more foreign concessions. But that's after the Art Deco period anyway, so we don't really care, right? <laughs> <laughs> Throughout Shanghai, you will find examples of that golden age of architecture. Uh, Grosvenor House was a Sassoon property. Uh, Sir Victor Sassoon uh, had lots of uh, real estate interests all over the city, and Grosvenor House was uh, the very latest. It was the coolest place to live in the French concession. <laughs> if you didn't have a big mansion house, of course, of your own. This had all the modern conveniences. Some people did have their own landed property, however. This is a little farther out in the French concession, uh, still there. Uh, and some of the wealthy Chinese also um, built in this style in other parts of the city. Um, again, we'll go through all these stories when uh, we get to the World Congress, but to make a long story short, Mr. Rong Desheng was the, uh, one of the members of a very wealthy family uh, who had made a lot of money, and this was their family home. You see a star with a torch on top of it today. It is used as a children's palace, an after-school activity center for students. Uh, it is no longer in the Rong family's possession. Uh, we'll also study at the World Congress 
the very unique style of residential architecture found only in Shanghai, what we call the Li Longs, the lane neighborhoods, a uh, very special style of architecture that combines east and west together, and for a period, uh, also the Art Deco style. Unfortunately, many of these neighborhoods are the ones that are being demolished to make way for the super tall buildings that you see. So they're becoming uh, rarer and rarer. The one on the left is no longer around, so we can't go and see that one. There are also very interesting other buildings. Can anybody see what that building is made in the shape of? An airplane, that's right, a biplane. This was built by the Chiang Kai-shek government in the new uh, municipal government area in the northeastern part of Shanghai, um, but used very, very briefly because, and the Japanese chased him out, uh, and they used it for a little while. It's now part of a military hospital. Um, another one of the apartment buildings in the French concession, former French concession, the Astrid. Uh, I've had the pleasure of taking several Russian uh, people of Russian extraction through the building where they, their families lived. There were lots of Russians who came to Shanghai uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution uh, in 1917. So in the 19, by 1930, the largest expatriate population in the French concession was not French, but Russian. I also had a wonderful experience here a few years ago, a few months ago. Um, I've met plenty of older Shanghainese who were educated in English at missionary schools, but having lived in the French concession for many years now, I had never met any uh, old Shanghai person who had been educated in the French system. But I was uh, looking outside of this building with showing it to a Canadian friend uh, and waiting for someone to open the security door so we could get in. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, the, the door opened finally and an old man uh, toddled out and he, he looked up at us and he said, Monsieur, vous parlez français? <laughs> And we had a wonderful time talking to him. He was uh, he born in this area. And he went to the French uh, uh, school system just down the road, the French high school, primary school and high school. And he went on to study medicine at uh, l'Université de l'Aurore, Aurora University, the French, uh, best French university in China, uh, and practiced medicine for the rest of his professional life and retired to the same neighborhood. He, he hasn't moved more than uh, 300 yards, I think, in his entire life. Uh, we'll talk about people who went the other way, too. Uh, this was the um, Shanghai headquarters of the National Young Women's Christian Association, the, YMC, the YWCA. It's right behind our host hotel, the Peninsula Hotel, and it was designed by an architect named Poi Gum Lee. And we'll talk all about him. He was from New York. <laughs> he, he was born and raised in Brooklyn of Chinese descent, and, uh, you know, back then it was hard to get architectural work in New York if you were Chinese, even if you were true uh, blue blood or blue American. Anyway, he, uh, he moved to Shanghai to get work and was able to, uh, through various connections, get work with the YMCA and the YWCA and created some of the most beautiful examples of what we call Chinese Art Deco architecture. So many of the motifs here you can see uh, are Chinese in nature, uh, but the overall, and I, sh I should have put in a, uh, an overall picture of the, uh, the building's exterior, the step backs typical of Art Deco period, and, and many other details. It's a really uh, excellent example of that melding of East and West that makes Shanghai Art Deco unique. This may look a bit more familiar, though. Uh, the old Empire Apartments, also in the French concession, um, showing both the horizontal lines uh, as well as the vertical speed lines drawing the eyes upward. Um, another Sassoon property, the old Metropole Hotel. Uh, that could be somewhere in New York too, right? Or in Chicago, I suppose. Undergoing renovation now. Here's a rather futuristic looking Art Deco apartment building, uh, the Elizabeth. Uh, and right close to it, uh, a residential building. That's kind of a, 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 a split, right? Uh, left and right, Art Deco style. Another example of a lane neighborhood facade with typical Art de Deco uh, motifs. And you know some of these uh, excellent examples of uh, Art Deco architecture, this one by one of the most prolific firms in old Shanghai, uh, Leonard Weisser and 
Cruz, 1935, the Gascoigne Apartments. Uh, we are very fortunate that they are still standing there and we'll be able to uh, go and visit many of these examples. What is the Art World Congress on Art Deco? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, hosted every two years by one member of the International Coalition of Art Deco Societies and is generally five days a week of uh, presentations half a day and tours the rest of the day and parties and fun at night. Um, and it's been in some of the world's uh, greatest Art Deco cities. It started in Miami Beach in 1991. Um, we have a lot uh, to be grateful for because of the Miami uh, initiatives. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, four years ago, two years ago in Havana, which was terrific. And I put down Chicago, but Joe uh, was, uh, reminded me that actually that year, the World Congress uh, of Art Deco was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> you laugh. Fantastic Art Deco, oil boom, right? Back in the 20s and 30s. Um, but there was a pre or post um, Congress trip to Chicago at that time. Um, so uh, to, to my mind, that qualifies Chicago to still host the World Congress. Get busy, you guys. Uh, for our pre-Congress uh, trip, uh, it will be to Beijing. Um, we figured that some people, even though there's not that much Art Deco in Beijing, people would you know, want to tick off the box, right? I've been to the Forbidden City, I've been to the Great Wall. Uh, and then after the Congress, we'll go to Nanjing. Uh, uh, just an hour and a half to the west of Shanghai by bullet train, which uh, was the national capital, the capital of China during the Chiang Kai-shek period, and uh, therefore it had a building boom uh, in the late 20s and early 30s. So there's plenty of Art Deco to be found there. Um, as I mentioned, in the mostly usually in the mornings, we'll have lectures. Uh, this is a picture of an expert from New York talking about uh, Art Deco uh, at the Havana conference uh, two years ago. And I think there was also a speaker from Chicago. Is Keith in the room by any chance? Is he still around? Working on the um, Art Deco survey project? When's that gonna be done, Joe? It's in progress. In progress, okay. Anyway, so there'll be lots of interesting speakers. Uh, at the Congress, and then of course walking tours. Uh, we're planning right now to have uh, tours at, of the Bund area, Hongko, which is that northeastern part of the city, the former French concession to the west, race course area right in the middle of the city, and Bubbling Well Road, or Nanjing Road, western part. Uh, so we'll cover a good deal of that uh, area that you saw mapped earlier. And as I mentioned, there will be plenty of opportunities for social interaction including that uh, final gala at the Peace Hotel Ballroom. We'll also have a couple of interesting meals, including at M on the Bund, uh, and they have agreed to recreate a menu from the Art Deco period, so we can enjoy that. Uh, we're trying to convince the Peace Hotel to do the same thing. Uh, so if you have any requests about that, let me know. Uh, we, are, we have been working hard for the last several years to prepare for the World Congress on Art Deco, in part by uh, putting together several Art Deco weekends, compressed congresses where we do lectures and have tours and also some social interaction just over a two-day period. And the last one is going to be uh, at the end of this month. Uh, we also you know, managed to garner a little bit of press coverage for these activities, so the world should be well informed that there is going to be this thing called the World of Congress of Art Deco in Shanghai in November, November 1 to 6, put it on your calendars now. Um, and um, if you want to participate, and I encourage you all to do so, uh, it is quite easy to do. You visit the website uh, and register online, uh, then you make your hotel reservation and um, get the hotel to give you a letter that says that you are booked. That's necessary for when you go to get your visa and it should be a tourist visa. You're very lucky here in Chicago because you have a Chinese consulate here. And the consul general, I'll have you know, is from Shanghai. So he will be very happy that you're going to visit uh, Shanghai. Uh, and then, um, you know, you get ready and have a great time in, in uh, Shanghai. This is the exterior of the host uh, uh, hotel, the Peninsula Hotel. 
Uh, it is a new hotel done in Art Deco style. That's what we call Deco Echo or Nouveau Deco, if you care. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a, one of the finest hotels uh, in the world, really. It's extremely uh, comfortable and in the Art Deco style. Now, some people will say it's new, so therefore it shouldn't be uh, where we hold our Art Deco Congress, but they really try hard there, and they put on a good show too. So that's where we're going to have it. Uh, it is on the expensive side, so we've also arranged with the Peace Hotel, just a little tick below that, and also uh, the Metropolo Bund Hotel, which is just behind the Peace Hotel. They're all right in the same area, and that's a very reasonably priced one. So there's something for everybody. And if you want to have more information, those are the, uh, the contact information that you need. Uh, the website, an email, and we hope to see you in Shanghai. I'd be very pleased to answer your questions. Thanks for your attention. This, by the way, is the cover of one of the very few books on Shanghai Art Deco that's out there by our co-founder, Tess Johnston, and her collaborator, uh, Deke R. Um, there will be books and other items on sale at the venue, and that has proved to be uh, very popular in previous Congresses. So, who's got a question? Given the Western influence of Art Deco, was there any official or unofficial government attitude under the Communists? Complicated question. Uh, I'll repeat it. Uh, the gentleman would like to know that if there was any uh, official policy towards Art Deco architecture or Art Deco period on, be, on the part of the uh, communist government in China. And the answer is no. Um, they wouldn't know probably what Art Deco was. <laughs> I mean, most people don't, let's face it, right? Um, but of course, the uh, part of the story of Shanghai and what makes it most very complicated is that uh, after the revolution, um, the new rulers were quite uh, afraid that the capitalistic reflexes of the Shanghai people, the most business-oriented city, the most open city in China, uh, would infect the rest of the country. So in effect, they put the city under a deep freeze and for about 40 years, uh, very little was built in Shanghai and very little was torn down. And it was not quite ignored because this, the, the uh, government was very interested in having the factories continue to run and produce. Shanghai was and is a very, uh, you know, contributes a very high percentage of the national gross domestic product. But for those 40 years, very little was uh, built and very little was torn down. And the, the history of many of these buildings, the stories of the people who lived and worked in them were lost. And part of the reason that uh, we started the uh, historic Shanghai group in 1998 was because we asked people about these buildings and their histories and we didn't get very good answers. So we started our own group. We have built a small library. We do research uh, and put together presentations and, and tours for the local community to try to you know, recreate uh, and rediscover some of the stories of these buildings. And that's also part of the reason that we kind of collect these older folks who have some of those stories, um, or younger people whose family heirlooms include items that are related to that period of the history. Uh, I'm sorry, the question, the second question is over here. Uh, the, the question is, uh, is, is there a, a resurgence of Art Deco uh, you know, in, in, China, in Shanghai today? And the, that's an easy one to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you walk around Shanghai and you have an eye that has been trained to recognize Art Deco elements, you will see them absolutely everywhere. And it's our theory that part of the reason uh, that that's the case, that, that is new buildings uh, are including Art Deco elements in their design, is because somehow to a Chinese, or rather a Shanghainese eye, they look right. 
Uh, and I, I think you will agree that uh, if there is a style that can be associated with uh, modern architecture in Shanghai, it would be Art Deco. That's not to say that all of the iconic buildings that are new uh, are Art Deco in style. That's not the case by any means, but there is a lot of Deco echo there. So good question, thank you. I see the one Deco radio at the bottom of those uh, images. What was the influence of Deco on industrial design and these other Deco shapes? Right, uh, what was the influence uh, on, uh, of Art Deco on industrial design in China? Um, significant, um, it was the in style, right, for um, 20 years in the, the earlier part of the century, and that, and Shanghai was not immune to that influence. So, um, much like uh, re more recent in more recent history, uh, many of the design ideas came from abroad, uh, arrived in Shanghai, uh, and were copied uh, and in incorporated into local designs and local manufacture. Um, you see that in lighting. In, uh, well, in furniture design, very interesting because a lot of the Art Deco influence was, uh, or Art Deco design was based on um, fine materials, uh, uh, a lot of bent chrome, you know, uh, uh, elements and all the rest. But in China, the uh, cabinetry tradition is based entirely on wood. So what we got in the Art Deco period in China, especially in Shanghai, were very beautiful Art Deco designs rendered in wood. Sometimes upholstered, but upholstery was also a foreign concept. Um, and so you get a different type of uh, Art Deco furniture. And that's, again, part of the reason that we wanted to have the World Congress in Shanghai was to familiarize the Art uh, Deco world with what was going on uh, in Shanghai in, in that period, because it's a little bit different. Okay, that's two very different questions, right? One is, um, are there Art Deco elements in the new designs? Art, well, not so much that, but just the knowledge uh, on the part of young people studying architecture and being are, the, are they aware of Art Deco? That's one question. The other is, is there uh, historic preservation going, going on? That's two very different questions. Um, the first question is easier to answer, that is, or they're both easy to answer. Uh, yes, the younger architects are aware of Art Deco and are incorporating th those elements into their designs in some cases, right? I mean, everybody's, there's a range of uh, um, uh, preferences in architectural style, and of course, the final arbiter is always the owner of the building. Um, but I think that a lot of that influence is, is unconscious because in most of the architectural schools, Art Deco is not uh, studied very assiduously, and it is in some cases looked down upon, right, as just a, a, a ornamental style and not a, a school, if you will. But because Art Deco is so important in Shanghai architectural history, the universities with architectural schools, uh, architecture schools in Shanghai have people who are specialized in Art Deco, and I think those individuals are having an effect on the next generation of, of architects. With respect to historic preservation, uh, the story is, is not so optimistic in that there are, there's not the same um, foundation uh, for encouraging historic preservation as we have in many Western countries. That is, uh, uh, tax breaks, uh, other kinds of encouragements and restrictions on what you can do with buildings. There is a list of protected buildings in Shanghai. Uh, many of the buildings that are on that list are related in some way to the development and history of the Communist Party. Uh, it's sort of like in the United States, if George Washington slept there, it's on the list, right? Um, but perhaps even more uh, critical in, in the, the situation with regard to historic preservation is there aren't people trained in historic preservation technique 
Now you can go to university here and uh, get a degree, right, in historic pre preservation and how you treat brick and wood and metal and all the things that come with a historic building. Uh, in China, there is no place to study that. And of course, given its uh, state of go-go development, the developers are mostly interested in uh, making a lot of money and making it really fast. And it is almost always, as you know, more expensive to preserve and protect uh, than it is to tear down and build new. So the danger uh, is, is magnified because of the conditions um, uh, not, not conducive to historic preservation. Good question. Yes, sir. <coughs> Uh, actually, the Grosvenor House that you saw there, that's the, that's the old Jinjiang Hotel. That's part of the several buildings in that block. Uh, you thought it was Broadway Mansions? It looks a little bit like that, but it's not. That's, that was, Grosvenor House was part of what's today the old Jinjiang Hotel. Um, should have had the Park Hotel in this presentation, but did not. Yeah, it's a terrific building, still there. Unfortunately, Nothing of its original interior is intact. Uh, it's a real shame because it was gorgeous inside and out. Uh, we also cannot get to the ballroom on the top floor anymore. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming and talking with us about Shanghai Patrick, especially previewing the, um, the World Congress. Uh, for those of us who are really curious and for those of us who might not be able to go, are there resources that talk about um, more in depth Yeah, uh, well, if you go to that website, there's some material. Um, is there a bibliography on the website? Not yet. not yet, but we should have a bibliography up there. You know, it, it, unfortunately, there's not a lot uh, written um, about specifically Art Deco. And even Shanghai's history, which is a complicated one, there's not one book that you can say, oh, go read that. Um, but there is a, a long reading list. Um, We'll make sure to put that up on the on the website. Thank you for that suggestion. Yes, ma'am. Well, sure, sure there was. And in fact, the, the fellow Poi Gum Lee that I mentioned is a good example of a guy who kind of, you know, worked both sides and, and was influenced by, by both sides. Um, one of the speakers at the World Congress is actually a Polish lady who is a PhD student and her, one of her specialties is the interaction back and forth and that, you know, the, the influence from the West on, on, uh, on the, the East is, is, is kind of well documented. But how about the other way around? So that interaction is something that uh, a few people are very interested in. So you should come to the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I, we really appreciate uh, your um, attention. It's, as I mentioned, great to be back in Chicago Cubs are doing a little better this year, and uh, we look forward, and maybe next year. Uh, we'll stick around for a little while and answer some questions. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, Joe, thank you very much for arranging just about everything, and it's great to see so many familiar faces as well. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Thank you again, everyone, for attending, and we hope to see you at our next lecture again, June 11th, um, and the uh, University of Chicago Oriental Institute. See you, bye.